Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Palliative Care 101. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For nearly four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resources, please visit www.caregiver.org. Uh, and now for some quick housekeeping. During the webinar, your phones or mics are going to be muted. If you have any questions, you can ask them by using the chat style question box on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We're also going to be asking for some feedback, and we use this to help shape future education programs. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling this out. We really do uh, read all your comments. So today I'd like to welcome Judith Redwing Kesar. Uh, Redwing has been intimately involved with palliative care for over two decades. Uh, when she became a nurse, her intention, kind of, as she puts it, was to be uh, a midwife to the dying uh, by caring for uh, the critically and terminally ill. As such, her career evolved uh, quite logically from uh, oncology to critical care, hospice, and finally palliative care. Uh, her kind of experience and knowledge of these, uh, these disciplines, hospice, palliative care, um, critical care, oncology, is professional, but there's also a personal aspect to it as she was uh, diagnosed with cancer, uh, kind of bringing her into the same world that, um, that had, that's been part of her patient's experience. Uh, Red Wing is currently the director of a unique community-based palliative care program at Seniors at Home, which is part of uh, Jewish Family and Children's Services, uh, and this is in San Francisco. She's also an author, teacher, national presenter, and frequent contributor to the public debate about palliative care. Uh, I know just recently um, Red Wing's been giving presentations at uh, on uh, kind of end-of-life issues in palliative care uh, in the Bay Area, so she is a, a well-known, well-respected speaker, and we're very happy to have her with us uh, this afternoon this morning, depending on what part of the country you're from. So now that you know a little bit more about our speaker, I'd like to turn things over to Red Wing. Thank you so much, Calvin. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this, is, this is not the typical venue that I'm used to presenting in, so I can't see who you all are out there, but I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you're wanting to know a little bit more about this subject that we don't all know so much about. And the reason why it is important is this headline. The world death rate is holding steady at 100%, which means that each and every one of us is going to face our mortality at some point. You know, I can't really start this morning without... Um, saying that not only do we need to understand palliative care for ourselves and each other, but this morning I feel that our country is in need of some palliative care. The word palliative in the first old definition back in Roman times meant to cover or to cloak. And as time went on, to palliate meant to make things better to improve the quality of. And that is the goal of palliative care in healthcare. And I certainly hope it's the goal of all of us as we go forward into uh, the political arena of our country is to make things better. So we're gonna talk a little bit this morning about the fundamentals of palliative care because it is still something that so many people misunderstand. And it's just so important that because it is such a kind of odd and complex word that has many definitions that we all um, get on the same page and have a basic understanding of what palliative care is. So palliative care is not only a model of health care, it's also a philosophy of care. And the philosophy is the philosophy that underlies all kinds of comfort care that basically says 
in order to make things better, in order to improve quality of life. We have to look at people holistically. We have to take into account not only their suffering on a physical level, but their suffering on an emotional, mental, psychological level their social needs as well as all of their psychological needs um, need to be addressed in order to really try to prevent suffering and relieve suffering. So in, in the medical world, palliative care has become a medical model that addresses pain and symptom management. Um, and in the model of community-based palliative care, like the program that I run at Jewish Family and Children's Services, it's more focused on providing what we call the extra added layers of support, the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual aspects of care. Um, there's a national organization called the Center to Advance Palliative Care that's main definition is about palliative care being a medical specialty that offers these extra added layers of support and when they were first trying to decide how to define palliative care you know there were focus groups around the country and of course most people said if you were offered extra added layers of support would you want them and who's going to say no to that so why is palliative care so important? Many reasons. There are 76 or 80 million of us who consider ourselves baby boomers who are getting older, who in the next 30 years are going to be getting seriously ill and coming to the end of our lives. Um, when I did this presentation for the LGBT conference on dementia last year, I also talked about the fact that there are 1.5 million LGBT people over 65 in this country. Um, palliative care is really critical in terms of building communities of people who, as I said, who are understanding what this means and how to address end of life issues differently. We have been in a culture that has been very death-denying for a long time. It's been hard to talk about death and dying. You know, we've lived through times of people calling it death panels when you discuss hospice care. Um, and yet, you know, in the old days back in, <laughs> before 1950, before medical technology, um, you know, families and communities did come together to take care of the, the aging and the sick and people who are dying in somewhat more holistic ways. And we've gotten away from that and we've, as I said, become a culture that doesn't want to talk about death and dying. We are more focused on anti-aging and how we can all stay young and beautiful and not have to age, which sort of implies that if we don't have to age, maybe we don't have to die. But like the first slide, sl first so slide said, um, death rate's still 100%. So palliative care provides a bridge between acute medical care and hospice care. And it's really about communication. It's about dialogue um, among clients, among families, among healthcare teams. Palliative care is, by definition, a team sport. It's not just provided by one clinician. It's provided by a team that is usually at least a doctor, a nurse, and a social worker. Ideally, there's a chaplain as part of that team often there are volunteers as part of that team. So in, in addressing issues of suffering, we look at it from many different perspectives. Is this slide going to come up? Oh, there it is. The slide's coming up slowly. Maybe you will see it. <laughs> Maybe you won't. So this is this is just a, a more graphic image of how palliative care is, is provided that, as you can see on this slide, 
when someone has a serious illness, they can be accessing palliative care. I think the slide isn't showing up quite fully. Oh, there it is. Um, they can be accessing palliative care at the same time as they are accessing curative therapies or treatments for a serious illness. And it's only at when curative care is no longer really useful that another kind of palliative care comes into place, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is hospice care. Um, there have been many studies in this country over the last years that really show us that when people who have a serious illness have access to palliative care early on in that illness, for some people, especially for cancer patients, um, but I would say in this context, also for people with cognitive impairments, the sooner that you get um, palliative care, that you get people communicating with you about all the aspects of suffering, suffering that are going on, the better it is. And the studies have been mostly addressed in terms of cancer patients, but show us that people who get palliative care concurrently with curative treatment not only have better quality of life, but actually live longer. So this is, you know, one of those million dollar questions that people still have a really hard time answering. How, how is palliative care different from hospice? So many people, when you say the word palliative care, they think it's the same thing as hospice. They think that palliative care means end of life care. They think it's only for people who are dying. This is very true of many, many healthcare clinicians that they don't really understand the difference between palliative care and hospice. So what you really need to understand is that palliative care, as I said, is a philosophy of care. And hospice, it's the philosophy that underlies hospice because hospice is also about supporting people um, holistically but in the last six months of life. So hospice provides palliative care at the end of life. Palliative care can be provided much sooner than the last six months of life from day of diagnosis onward. Hospice in this country is very much defined by the Medicare benefit that says that a doctor has to say, you would probably have six months or less to live in order to be eligible for hospice care. And up until recently, in order to be eligible for hospice, you had to also forego whatever we were seeing as curative treatment. Um, sometimes that's certain kinds of medications. In cancer patients, it's often chemotherapy. The reason for this, quite honestly, is that once you're accessing your hospice benefit, um, hospice has to pay for all of your medical treatments and most many curative treatments are quite expensive and because the goal of hospice is to keep you comfortable at the end of life that's not paid for. There are some changes going on in this country right now with some pilot programs of people being able to access curative treatment at the same time as getting hospice care if it's clear that really that treatment is mostly palliative. It's to make their quality of life a bit better um, without the expectation that it's necessarily going to allow them to live longer. Um, for many years now in California, we have had this in place for palliative care for children and hospice for children that um, when children are diagnosed with a serious life-threatening illness, they are able to get curative care at the same time as hospice care. So again, palliative care helps people at all stages of illness or decline, not just people who are dying at the end of life. And of course, people who are suffering from dementia are suffering often for very long periods of time and not just that last six months. just want to quickly go over some of the common myths um, about hospice care because hospice is palliative care at the end of life. A lot of people think, oh, okay, 
um, we're going to get referred to hospice, so finally I'm going to have somebody at my bedside 24-7. That is really, really not true. Um, hospice does not provide attendant level care. When someone's referred to hospice, they become your medical team. And they are also, a t as I said, with palliative care, a team, doctors, physici physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplaincy. Um, they typically visit people a couple of times a week when someone is actively dying, close to dying at the end of life. They will often come on a regular basis every day, but they're not the ones there 24-7 turning someone who is bed bound, making sure they're getting, you know, fluids and hydration and being turned and cleaned and all that. In, in order to care for someone at home at the end of life who is on hospice, you really do need resources because hospice does not pay for everything. Hospice pays for the medical aspects of your care, but not for the attendant level care, not for the day-to-day, round-the-clock care that most people need in the dying process. So in order to keep people at home, you either have to have the means to pay for hired assistance, whether that's through in-home supportive services, depending on the state you live in, through privately hired home care agencies, or by really organizing friends and family to be able to provide round-the-clock care. So what are the main similarities, again, between palliative care and hospice? Both of them are focused on the relief of suffering through pain and symptom management and through really looking at someone holistically. Because often, you know, many of us have probably seen it's not just physical pain that is causing someone suffering when they're ill. They're worried about their families, they're worried about <sighs> what's going to happen to, to their financial reality, to people who are close to them. There are emotional issues that are unresolved that if that's not dealt with, that's often a huge layer of suffering and sometimes people can't even communicate that to us. And so figuring out ways to address all that is incredibly important. Hospice always includes palliative care, but palliative care does not always include hospice. And that's really, you know, if you remember one, one thing from this webinar, please know that, that it's an interdisciplinary team that provides the care, but that palliative care can be implemented at any time during a serious illness. So, where do we get palliative care? That's still a huge challenge. So as we've spoken about palliative care in this country for the last 15, 20 years, it was really developed as a medical model and palliative care teams exist in most major hospitals in this country. Um, certainly here in San Francisco in the Bay Area, we are very lucky that um, I believe every major medical center has its own inpatient palliative care team. We also have an outstanding outpatient palliative care team at UCSF, both in the cancer center and the neurology department is now starting its own outpatient palliative care. There are programs like uh, Sutter System has the AIM program, Advanced Illness Management, which does treat people outside of the hospital. Because palliative care is most easily accessible in the hospital, it's, it's been better known as in this form as a medical model. What we're understanding now is that community-based palliative care is really the next wave because when people need it the most is once they're discharged from the hospital. However, if you have a loved one who is hospitalized and you feel that there are complications going on in their treatment or that 
your person has advanced dementia as well as other complicated illnesses, but people aren't addressing all of the parts of that person, you can ask for a palliative care consultation in the hospital because that team is trained especially in having communication skills and being able to sit down and have family meetings with patients and families and other clinicians and really help everyone get on the same page about what really does make sense in terms of health and healing for this particular person at this stage of their life and their illness. But again, this is sort of still a well-kept secret. A lot of people know, don't know that you can ask for a palliative care consultation. Um, you know, it's not like you're given a piece of paper when someone's admitted to the hospital that says, yeah, if you're having communication problems or if you're wondering if this treatment that's being offered really makes sense, please call our palliative care team and consult with them. But it's something that people need to know is really accessible to everyone. So here's a picture of a good situation of, you know, family members, maybe a volunteer, being able to have a positive experience with their loved one. There have been a lot of studies. This is still, this is actually an old study, but I don't think the outcome has changed too much about what is really most important to family caregivers. They want their loved one's wishes honored. Even if that person has not been able to clearly state their wishes, when you know someone over a long per period of time, you often do have an understanding of what is important to them. Family caregivers want to be included in the decision-making process with health care providers, which again is something that we need to be able to advocate for and ask for. Of course, we want assistance at home and we want that to be affordable and we are still working on that in this country. Uh, family members need practical help, clients patients, whatever we want to call them, depending on what aspect we come from, you know, things like transportation, access to medicines, access to appropriate equipment, all of these things are really important in terms of providing um, quality of life and relief of suffering. Of course, the personal care needs have to be taken care of. People want honest information, they want to be listened to, and um, you know, caregivers also want to be remembered and have communication after their loved one dies, often with the healthcare system. So, I want to talk just a little bit, you know, specifically about palliative care in people with dementia. I'll actually be doing a bigger presentation with the Alzheimer's Association in December um, about this topic because, you know, as Many of you who are out there who are caregivers for people with dementia understand that need for spiritual and emotional and psychological care often comes long before the need for a hospice referral because that period of time of suffering can be extensive. And not only the person who is suffering with the disease needs support, but the caregivers and the family members need those extra added layers of support, often for months and years. And, you know, a lot of times I see that healthcare providers, unfortunately, don't always account for realities of social differences, cultural differences, um, people who have cognitive impairment who don't have families and are at high, high risk for neglect, for isolation. There are so many more issues, for, especially for people who don't have families and caregivers with dementia. But, you know, even, even for people who do have support, you know, you know that when you're watching someone go through the decline of disease with a cognitive impairment, 
it's often slow, it's often long, and when you're the one there 24-7, sometimes you don't recognize how different someone is from week to week or month to month. I had a client a couple of years ago who, um, he had Parkinson's disease along with dementia, and his wife was his 24-7 caregiver, and our agency was called in to provide home care attendance because she could no longer take care of him. He he was a very he was a big man. She couldn't change him and get him dressed and get him up easily. So we went in and started providing care and one of our staff members who had met this couple said to me, you know, I think they need a palliative care consultation because he seems really to be declining quickly. So I actually went and met with this family, with the wife, and um, actually went out with the volunteer physician who's on my team. And what I saw coming into this situation with somewhat fresh eyes, not having known them for a long time, was I saw a man who was very close, seemingly, to the end of his life, was unable to make eye contact, unable to communicate. Um, unable to take care of himself and I asked his wife if anyone had ever talked about hospice care and of course people get taken back at that word because they think often that it means oh my gosh that you think the person's gonna die tomorrow and no hospice is a six-month benefit and it did seem to me in this case that there was a good good chance that this man was not gonna last more than six months I then called his neurologist to ask about a hospice referral, and her response was, oh, you've got to be kidding. He's one of my star patients. He's going to live for a long time. About a week or 10 days later, he had another major fall and ended up in the hospital. And in the hospital, we were able to meet with the hospital-based palliative care team and all of his family, his four children and his wife, and I met with them and we all discussed the prognosis that at that point, um, none of the doctors in the hospital, including the palliative care physicians and nurses and social workers, thought that his prognosis was more than a few months. And at that point, he was transferred to a residential hospice here in San Francisco, still thinking he might have a couple of months, but it would make his wife's life much easier to not have to be the 24-7 caregiver, and she couldn't afford to pay for round-the-clock care. So he went to this residential hospice where all of his physical and medical needs were taken care of, and he died a week later. His wife said to me a month later, you know, it was so important to me to have people come in and do a consultation with us who saw the bigger picture, who had the experience to be able to see where my husband was on the trajectory of illness and decline that I wasn't able to see. And so often it does take people outside of that family situation of 24-7 caregivers who are able to to help people move forward with understanding how it would be best to take care of someone who is in serious decline and towards the end of life. And that is what palliative care is about. So one of the other things that palliative care includes is advanced care planning. Now I'm hoping that almost all of you who are listening to this have your own advanced directive for health care completed. It's really critical that pretty much that everybody over 18 in our country gets a voter registration card and an advanced directive for health care. Because we never know when, when our time is going to be up and whether it's through a traumatic accident or a serious illness or a decline. It is so, so important, and I just can't stress this enough, that we all need to have advanced directives for healthcare 
that are specific, that really reflect who we are and the values that we have had as a human being on this earth. The conversations that we need to have with those that we love, those who are our deemed as our decision makers if we can't speak for ourselves. But really, more it's more than that. It's having conversations with the people in your life and in your circle of friends and family who you think are going to show up for you if you have a serious illness. And they need to know how you feel about that. You know, again, because we've lived in a culture for so long where we don't want to think about death, we don't want to think about illness, we put it off and we put it off. And yet, you know, suddenly a day comes when we have some kind of serious event and we can't speak for ourselves and we can't advocate for ourselves and we need someone else to. That person needs to be able to speak for us, not to say what they think would be best, but what they know is best because they've spoken to us about it. And certainly with people with early stages of dementia, um, it is so critical for those documents to be in place and those conversations to take place while someone still has the capacity to tell you about their values, to share who they are, and to make some decisions for themselves. Because we all know that once someone is deemed in our healthcare system to not have capacity to make decisions, um, if there is no one who is written down as their decision maker, then it is left to the healthcare system. And, you know, I just saw a, a study that came across my desk about 10 days ago that talked about the increase in the numbers of people with dementia and advanced cognitive impairment who are ending up in intensive care units on full life support and, and often on in situations of ongoing ventilation and technical support to keep them alive only because they did not have their wishes in writing. I can't stress how critical this is. Even if you don't have a person in your life to write as your agent, it's still really important to write down what your wishes are. It doesn't matter what particular form that you use. There are many different advanced directive forms. There's one called the five wishes, which I like a lot because it's written in very clear English and not in medical language or legal language. There's a document from Kaiser that you can that anyone can download. You don't have to be a Kaiser patient that is also a very clear document. There's also a fabulous website developed by Dr. Rebecca Sidori here in San Francisco called Prepare. And I believe the website is prepareforyourcare.org and it is on one of the slides. Which is it's a website that has both audio and you can go through all of the questions on the website. It's in uh, fifth grade understanding. It's very simple and it really walks you through the critical questions that one needs to answer in terms of what your wishes are at the end of life. And again, it's I just can't stress enough how important this is. You know, there are many cases that have gone on in the United States that have ended up in courts. There was a, just briefly, a man named Robert Wendland who was 40 years old who ended up being in what we call that persistent vegetative state, hooked up to IVs and ventilators for nine years, He was at, at the, starting at the age of 40 years old, um, because his he had never written down his wishes his wife knew that he would not want to be kept alive that way, but his mother insisted that if they were to take him off life support, that the wife would be killing him. It ended up as a court battle for nine years while he lay in a bed, basically not conscious and not aware of his surroundings, and he finally died of pneumonia. And the courts said 
If his wishes had been in writing, none of this would have happened. So it's just so critical, again, that we have take the risk to talk with the people that we love about who we are and what's important to us in our living and in our dying. Certainly, you know, things to consider, especially with people with cognitive impairment. As I said, early conversations are critical. Um, early neuropsych evaluations seem to be more and more important because there then are a host of other questions in terms of how we care for people at the end of life if they can't make decisions for themselves. Do they need a conservator? Do they need someone else who can make all the decisions for them? Or do have they been able to name a family member or a friend who they've trusted in their, in their life to make those decisions? So when someone is closer to the end of life, where does palliative care come in? It's still about helping people communicate. It's still about helping people understand what does quality of life mean for you? It's probably something slightly different for each and every one of us. And whether you're someone who says, you know, I want a tattoo, do not resuscitate on my chest because I never want to be in that situation of taken to a hospital and having someone pounding on my chest and risking breaking ribs and trying to resuscitate me and bring me back to life once I have stopped breathing. Or if you're someone who says, you know what, every single breath counts and I do want what Western medicine, medicine can do to just keep me alive as long as possible. And then there's all that gray area in between. But Again, we need to have conversations. We need to be willing to look at the fact that none of us gets out of here alive. And what are our options when we are getting closer to the end of life? Do we want minimal treatment? You know, if someone has dementia, but then they also have heart disease, or they also have a cancer diagnosis, or they just get a horrible pneumonia. Do you want to treat that with antibiotics? which we know will put, and they will likely end up in a weaker state after having a pneumonia if they're already debilitated. Um, those are questions to consider. If someone can't swallow and can't eat, do they, would they want a feeding tube? Um, I remember being at an ethics conference some years ago where a woman who was a very well-known ethicist said, please don't ever actually call it feeding tubes. We need to call it artificial nutrition and hydration because feeding is a way that people see expressing love in almost every subculture in our culture. We feed people because we love them. We want them to live. Feeding is a relationship. It's an act of connection. Whereas when someone has a tube, either in their nose or surgically implanted in their stomach. It is about artificial nutrition and hydration. And people choose that sometimes because they just want to stay here, often because they're afraid of the dying process, because they haven't been able to have conversations about it. Um, and some people are very clear, if I can't eat and I can't swallow and I can't take things in, please don't, don't be doing invasive procedures and putting tubes in me. Probably some of you have heard about this idea that now has a name, V said, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Um, Again, it's certainly something that used to happen when people had serious illness. People tended to stop eating and drinking because they didn't feel well. And then as they declined more, they eventually died. People often ask me, well, how long can you live if you stop eating and drinking? 
it totally depends on your age, the rest of your physical condition. You know, oftentimes people have been living with cognitive impairment for years and years and getting more frail and more weak, but their, their hearts or their lungs are still strong. So someone could stop eating and drinking and still live for, you know, weeks. The longest I've seen in my experience is probably about six weeks. But I worked with a woman recently who was in her 80s and she had very mild cognitive impairment, but she had very serious lung disease. And I had been having conversations with her and some of her friends for quite a while already. And she had one day where she just woke up and she didn't feel well at all. And she didn't want to eat. She was kind of nauseated. And by the end of the day, she realized she hadn't had anything to eat or drink all day. And she called her friends and she said, oh, this is it. I've stopped eating and drinking. I'm ready for the end of my life to happen. And three days later, she called me saying, what's going on? I haven't died yet and I haven't eaten or had anything to drink for three days. Um, it took 11 days for her, but her friends and family members supported her and took care of her and made sure her her lips were moist and her skin was moist and she stayed clean and she had what what by most standards would be a very peaceful death which is what she wanted and for her dying in the way that she took charge of was about quality of life So hospice is appropriate in certainly in the last six months of life, but it's important to have ongoing discussions with whoever your medical providers are. You know, as in the story I told before of, you know, the wife being with her husband 24-7 wasn't really seeing some of the signs of decline that someone outside of that family system would be able to see. So it's important to keep checking in when someone is in decline, when would hospice be appropriate? Because again, it's a six month benefit. And I've had many people go on to hospice and after four or five months, they've gotten better because they've actually gotten a really high level of care that they weren't used to. And then they've gone off hospice. And they've gone on and off hospice for three years, four years. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, and it certainly doesn't mean because you're getting a hospice referral, you're going to die tomorrow. It just means you're going to get an expert level of medical care at home to really help provide quality of life from that, especially medical perspective, but also um, providing some social services and certainly nursing care. So when anyone is in decline, I think it's always important to at least ask for a hospice informational visit. Talk to people at your local hospice and see if it is an appropriate time to refer someone to a hospice team. Um, we've talked a little bit already about that at the end of life it's important to realize that you need resources um, for assistance that whether that's paying for care having friends accessing in-home supportive services you need to know where those resources are available for you in your community in order to help you because it's almost impossible for one person or even sometimes two to be the round-the-clock caregivers for someone who is at the end of life. One of the things I talk to people about is this idea of keeping promises and it seems especially critical in people with dementia because often you've cared for them for a very long period of time and we make these promises to people that we love that I'll never put you in an institution. I'll, I'll, of course, I know that you don't want to die in a hospital and you don't want to be in a nursing facility and of course I'll keep you at home. It's a dangerous promise to make because sometimes at the end of life, 
it really is too difficult to manage the symptoms and the suffering of a person at home unless, as we've said, you have a lot of resources for help. My experience is that often, especially at the very end of life, people's external environments are not as critical as their internal environments. And so the room where their bed is may not make that much difference to them, even though five years ago or eight months ago they said they really wanted to be at home. When someone is dying, they're drawing in. They're closing down their uh, connections with the outside world. And so what's going on around them may not matter so much as the love that's being brought to them and the level of care that's being provided for them. And so oftentimes it really makes sense to have someone be in either a residential hospice or a facility that has a dementia unit where someone can be cared for around the clock by other people and you as the family caregiver can just show up to provide love and care for that person. Um, I do often caution people though when you're putting someone in a facility talk to them to make sure that they have a hospice waiver that a hospice team can come in there to provide end-of-life care when necessary make sure that the staff in that facility has had training both in dementia issues and in end-of-life issues because so often in facility situations you know the staff are really trained to keep people alive at all cost and yet when someone is trying to die that's not the focus anymore So being prepared in ourselves is also critical. Um, understanding some of the very basic signs and symptoms of approaching death, which, you know, we're not taught in school. We're, we don't all have like death and dying 101 class when you turn 21. So a lot of times if you're not in healthcare and you haven't been at the bedside of someone who's dying, you really don't know what, what to look for, what to respond to. So. You know, there are some typical things, and none of these happen for everyone, but, you know, often there is um, a loss of appetite and a weight loss, sleep patterns change, behavior patterns change, certainly at the very end of life, breathing changes. People have hallucinations, you know, we've probably seen people who at the end of life start talking to their grandmother who's been dead for 50 years. and. That's kind of normal and typical, and um, it's okay. Maybe they're getting some comfort for, from seeing their grandmother. We don't have to suddenly say, no, 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 just as, you know, with people with cognitive impairment in general, trying to tell them what's real is not always helpful. And so certainly in people with dementia, you may see an even more drastic increase in loss of memory, in mobility, in ability to communicate and find words and physical things like incontinence withdraw even worse withdrawal than you might have seen before those are all indications that maybe you need to talk to somebody you need to talk to your health care provider or someone on a palliative care team uh, as we all know, with people with cognitive impairment, the anticipatory grief of family caregivers could go on for years and years and years. And again, that's something that needs to be addressed, certainly because palliative care is about addressing the suffering, not just of the person who has the illness, but of the family members. Um, dealing with grief and grieving is a big part of that. It's so important to ask for help, and yes, it's so hard to do for so many of us. Um, certainly, Family Caregiver Alliance is a big place to go for help. Um, our program through Seniors at Home, we have what's called the Futures Program, that even if you don't think you need assistance right now, you can get a free assessment through our agency for home care in the future so that if a day comes when you suddenly do need help, you can just call us and you're already in our system. Um, and that's in terms of, of 
home care attendant levels of help as well as palliative care consultation. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, online support groups, the PREPARE website that I mentioned. Um, here in San Francisco, there is Open House, which deals with LGBT senior issues. Um, all of these things are, you know, accessible online and in person, and it's just so important to get support when you are a caregiver. It's important to know that there are other tools of the trade that are out there to help you. Uh, there are a deck of cards called Go Wish. I don't have time to go into the details of that today. Um, and then there's another deck called My Way Cards that are specifically for people with uh, cognitive impairment. But these are tools to be able to have conversations with people about what might or might not be important to them. Um, in times of serious illness or at the end of life. And certainly you can Google those things and find them. Uh, again, the PREPARE website, I'm glad I put it on so many slides. Uh, there's a book called Graceful Farewell that helps you organize all of your end of life wishes and paperwork in one place. Um, again, different kinds of advanced directives. Um, there's an exercise we do called sit, listen, and breathe, and there are all kinds of spiritual practices, self-care, websites, tapes. Um, again, just when you are a caregiver, ask for help because as we all know, the risk of caregivers getting sick when they've provided a lot of care for a loved one is, is a high risk. So you want to make sure you're caring for yourself and offering palliative care to yourself as well as to the person who's got an illness. So I just want to end with this uh, little meditation for, for all of you out there. And maybe you can, wherever you are, you can read it along with me or say it out loud with me. Um, whether we're professional caregivers or personal caregivers, self-care is critical. Offering my care and presence unconditionally, knowing that it may be met by gratitude or not, could be met by indifference or by anger or by anguish. May I, may we find the inner resources to truly be able to give. May we offer our love knowing that we cannot control the course of life, suffering, or death. May we remain in peace and let go of any expectations. May this experience open us to the true nature of life, which is impermanence. As we started out, 100% of us will die someday. May we see our own limits compassionately just as we view the suffering of others, of those we've cared for, of those we've loved. And may, may we all live and die in ease and at peace. And finally, a short poem, How Did the Rose Ever Open Its Heart and Give This World All Its Beauty? It felt the encouragement of light against its being. Otherwise, we all remain too frightened. You who are caregivers out there in the world, again, professional or personal, you are often the encouragement of light for people, especially people who can't communicate with us anymore, who have cognitive impairment, who have a serious illness. It's so important to be able to be that encouragement for people so that you are providing palliative care. You are part of the palliative care team everywhere in, the, in this world because it's, a, it's about helping people live with quality of life and with as little suffering as possible for as long as possible until their last breath. So thank you so much for being here today and we have a few minutes left for questions. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Redwig, um, for spending the afternoon with us. Um, I know we've uh, a lot of our caregivers have lots of questions about palliative care, and 
Uh, I definitely remember just growing up, it's not exactly the same, but you know, hospice care. I don't even know where I got this image, but I always had this image of kind of an unpleasant place where kind of old people went to die. And I think that's probably something that, you know, I don't know, eight or nine year olds, you know, they're not necessarily used to this kind of environment. Yeah. So it's just one of these misconceptions. So I'm glad you're here to kind of explain everything and explain kind of the link between hospice and palliative care. And, and kind of you know the, the the differences and the similarities. So we really do appreciate you spending the uh, the time with us. Absolutely. Um, yeah, as Red Wing mentioned, we do have some time for questions. Um, so I think we should get right to it. Uh, the first question is um, kind of a nuts and bolts question. A great question. This uh, person would like to know kind of how does palliative care get paid for? Is this something that? Uh, <laughs> Is this uh, something the insurance will pay for? Is um, you know, is there a copay or? So it's a great question. We're still working on palliative care reimbursement in this country. Um, obviously, if you're in a hospital, palliative care is going to be covered by whatever insurance you have that's paying for your hospitalization. In the outpatient world. Palliative care consultations are starting to be covered by insurance more and more. Um, in California, we have a new Senate Bill 1004, which is mandating that Medi-Cal actually pay for palliative care for Medi-Cal recipients. What that really is going to look like is still being worked out. Um, but anyone who is Medicare and Medi-Cal will have access to palliative care. Uh, per, you know, again, it's about consultation mostly and because there aren't a lot of community palliative care teams. Um, but we're hoping that as more and more people understand palliative care and demand it, that uh, there will be better avenues for reimbursement and there will be more outpatient clinics where you can go to meet with a team and receive palliative care. Perfect, thanks so much. Uh, we have another question um, about hospice care actually. So if, um, if we have maybe a family member or a spouse or a caregiver who um, really thinks the, the you know the person that they're they're taking care of their loved one their you know their spouse their parent um, uh, could use a uh, hospice care really think it's time for hospice care but it hasn't really been brought up by the uh, the medical team is that something they can just kind of ask for or how would they um, how would they broach that topic so typically a hospice referral needs to be made by a physician um, these days, often a nurse practitioner or physician assistant can also make that referral. Um, but certainly, I encourage families, if they feel strongly and maybe they've had some inclination or consultation that the person they're caring for is really in serious decline, you can always make a phone call to a hospice team on your own and ask for an informational visit where a hospice team member will come out and sit and talk to you about what hospice care provides and if and when it's appropriate. And from there, it's often easier to get a referral from a, from a physician because the hospice will kind of help you do that and might help you advocate. Um, you can also call your own clinicians and say, you really feel like you are watching someone in serious decline and you would like a hospice referral. Um, so again, you don't have to wait until the doctor says it's time for hospice because unfortunately, often doctors may not say that until, until very late in the game because for so many physicians, they think their job is to keep people alive and they feel that they have failed if they refer to hospice. And that's, you know, it's another area of education that we in the palliative care field are working hard to change. Thank you. We have a question from uh, another listener, um, a question about their parents. Um, their father has um, Alzheimer's and mother has a mild cognitive impairment 
Um, they actually both have cancer too and other, you know, kind of circulatory problems and things. Um, do you think um, they're, they, they were thinking based on the, the, the presentation that palliative care would probably be a good fit um, for their father, but um, do you think it might be appropriate for their mother as well, who has mild cognitive impairment with uh, cancer and circulatory problems? You know, absolutely. I mean, the truth is, with cancer patients, palliative care is appropriate from day of diagnosis onward. I mean, this is where the most studies have been done in our country that, that really have shown us that palliative care from day of diagnosis of a cancer diagnosis, along with whatever other treatments they're getting, really help improve that person's quality of life and quantity of life. And, you know, certainly in a situation like this, where you have two people who are suffering, having, having access to a palliative care team to deal with all of those layers of what that means is critical. There, you know, depending on where you are in the country or in the Bay Area, some of our hospices now have some of their own palliative care programs that aren't that last uh, six-month Medicare benefit, but that are sort of experimental programs. Certainly in the peninsula, there are hospice, Mission Hospice has a palliative care program, Hospice by the Bay in San Francisco, and the and Marin has a palliative care program in the Santa Rosa area. You can access palliative care. You know, I would say talk to whoever your main providers are, depending on where you live. Find out who is providing palliative care consultation in your area. And certainly it would be not only appropriate, but helpful. Perfect. Thank you so much. You know, I had. Um, You'll have to forgive me um, if this question doesn't make too much sense, but just um, uh, as we're talking about palliative care, I was wondering, is there, um, is this something where if it's decided it's a good fit and it's suitable, is there, um, are there any issues of maybe um, like capacity in terms of if you're able to do it, are there like, are there sometimes wait times in terms of not enough uh, staff to provide this or, you know, how does, you know, Okay, that's so that's kind of the million dollar accessible? question. Um, you know, at this point, there are very few clinicians who are actually trained in palliative care. As I've said, the palliative care teams exist mostly in hospitals. So in the community, it's a challenge. I have to admit, it's a challenge to find access to palliative care consultation. We are one of the few places as a social service agency that actually just provides palliative care consultation to anyone as a fee for service. Um, it really depends on the healthcare system that you're part of. Um, ideally, we want all clinicians, all primary care doctors and nurse practitioners to be able to have these kinds of palliative care conversations and teams uh, to work with, but we're a long way from that part, unfortunately. So it's not as easy to access. We're very aware of the limited supply of palliative care clinicians for the numbers of people who are in decline right now. And again, you know, demand creates capacity. So the more people out there are going to the healthcare world and saying, this is the kind of care we want. We want palliative care. We want a team of people to meet with us. Uh, the more people ask for it, the more likely it's going to happen. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you did mention before again that it's a lot of this is kind of demand. I mean, even if the supply is not available, if more people are asking for it, if more people understand what it is and really are demanding that, you know, this is provided, then it's something that, that um, uh, the health, you know, the healthcare system in general is really going to take more seriously. Exactly. And, you know, start to, you know, try and really advocate for this. Um, we have a great question here, actually. So I know you mentioned, you know, kind of what the, you know, kind of um, the staffing members who might be present in kind of a basic, you know, maybe palliative care um, setup and, you know, kind of what supports they offer both to the family and the patient. But in terms of um, dementia or Alzheimer's, this listener would 
uh, was curious to know what kind of support palliative care can offer these patients with some form of cognitive impairment. So, I would say it really depends on the particular situation. If that person's suffering is is really only, and not, not meaning only in a diminished way, but it's cognitive impairment as opposed to other kinds of physical disease. Um, you know, ideally you are working with a clinician who can recognize all of these levels of suffering that we talked about, the emotional and spiritual suffering that is still going on in someone who can't necessarily uh, communicate with us intellectually anymore. So I think it's much trickier in that situation. But again, here in San Francisco, the people in the neuro neurology department at UCSF are really recognizing how important it would be to provide palliative care to patients with dementia, to provide, to really look at that person as a whole person and try to address their suffering in whatever ways possible. Um, so it's not just about the physical suffering, but how do you get into that emotional reality of someone who, you know, who, who has cognitive impairment, who can't communicate clearly with you anymore. I think, I think there's a lot of hope in the future because of so many people understanding that dementia is an epidemic that is going to be incredibly widespread and a lot of professional caregivers in this field understanding that palliative care, addressing people holistically, is kind of the kindest way to deal with people with dementia. Great, thank you. Um, I know we've been, you know, maybe a little bit uh, after time, but I just had uh, one more question I think I'm going to take for myself, which uh, <laughs> will perhaps uh, betray my great ignorance of the, uh, the VA medical system. But in terms of uh, veterans and then former or um, current service members, in terms of uh, hospice and palliative care, are there options uh, within the VA system? Absolutely. The VA system in our country actually has one of the best palliative care programs. They were early adapters of the concepts of palliative care, the idea that it's a team. Certainly the VA hospitals here in, in the Bay Area all have uh, very strong palliative care teams. They often have their own hospices. The VA down on the peninsula has its own residential hospice. Uh, the VA tends to do, to be ahead of the curve in terms of providing palliative care and hospice care to their patients. So. That's, that's a great system to be part of. Okay, perfect. Well, I think that is uh, all the time we have for uh, today. Um, you know, I really do appreciate you spending the afternoon with us. Absolutely. If, um, if you were uh, interested in the webinar and you are uh, interested in maybe getting a little, little bit of a reminder or um, another primer to have uh, in your back pocket, we do, uh, Family Caregiver Alliance has a fact sheet, recently updated fact sheet on um, palliative um, care, you can find it on our website, caregiver.org. The easiest way to find it is probably to type in under the search field, palliative care, and that will be the very first search result. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for participating in our webinar today, presented by uh, Red Wing KSAR. The FCR webinars are free and continuing series, and you can always find more information uh, on our next webinar on our website. Uh, thank you again, uh, KSAR, for joining us, spending You're the afternoon welcome. with us. Uh, the webinar is now concluded, and uh, we hope to see you all next time. Have a great afternoon.